This week, the best in investigative journalism as we talk about a new book documenting the great Steinhoff heist. Behind the scenes of world-class facilities putting the South African film and production industry on the map, why a local expert says communications to the valuable informal economy was neglected during the Listeriosis crisis, and also why this ad was banned in the United Kingdom and subsequently became a viral hit. Well, a very warm welcome, and we're going to start the program with this. The great Steinhoff crash wiped more than 200 billion rand off the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and has gone down as probably South Africa's biggest ever corporate scandal. Now, in a painstaking exercise in great investigative journalism, the editor of the Financial Mail, Rob Rose, has produced the book Steinheist. Here are the questions. How did he pull it all together? How did he get people to talk to him? And I wonder what the ultimate fallout is going to be. Rob Rose, a very warm welcome to you. Before we get to the mechanics of writing and the investigative side of it, put all of this into some sort of perspective. Just how big and just how important is this particular issue? Well, in terms of governance in this country, how companies are run and how people perceive the corporate sector, it's, it's crucial. I mean, the, you know, you have a look at our pensions. Most people who work have a pension, and I think more than half the pensions in this country were invested in Steinhoff. I think there's 1,600 registered pension funds, of which 950 or so had invested in this company. But it goes beyond just the money that was lost there. It's basically about governance. It's about how companies are run and about accountability in our corporate sector. How was it allowed to go on for so long unchecked? Well, I mean, that's a question for the boards. I mean, the boards had allowed this thing to happen for so long. Um, but also, you know, it has to be said that when somebody commits a, a devious financial crime, they put a lot of effort into making sure that nobody can detect it. Mm. So a lot of work went into making sure that it wasn't easily detectable, and, and it seems to have, have worked for quite a long time. But it's astonishing that some people, whether it's a Marcus Joester or whether it's a Bernie Madoff or whatever the case is, are allowed to operate at such a high profile with such impunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, Steinhoff was a specific institution in in the Afrikaner business community. It was, you know, th there's a strong element of bullying of the CEO, Marcus Huerster, and people just didn't ask the right questions. It was a very strong hierarchical culture, which meant that, you know, alternative viewpoints weren't exactly welcomed in the boardroom. Um, so if you had a questionable deal, you know, nobody was going to raise questions about it. And a lot of those questionable deals were pushed through. For example, a year before they went bust, they bought mattress firm in the U.S. and they paid double what the market value was. Mm. And people thought it was insane at the time, and it clearly was. In the early days, um, what sort of culpability, if anything, do the media uh, accept for this, and even the investment analysts? You talk about asking questions. Were we asking the right questions at that point, or was there a kind of a general seduction because it was such a successful company or perceived to be as such? I think there is definitely an element of seduction. I think that there were analysts who did ask some questions, and, and I detail quite a few of them in the book. Some analysts who did actually sit down with people like Krista Visser and say, you know, you shouldn't invest in this company. And I think the media also, um, some people asked the right questions, but equally there's a, a large bulk of people who didn't. Uh, one of the analysts I spoke to said that there are two people who invest in Steinhoff. Uh, one of them, you know, one group of people don't understand Steinhoff and stay away. And the others just don't understand Steinhoff, but trust the other person who invested. So basically nobody understood Steinhoff. That's the bottom line. Um, and it just perpetuated itself for 20 years. So how do you start compiling an investigation like this? Where does the process begin? Well, I mean, you've written books, Jeremy, so you know it's, it's not it's not Just the one, and it's not easy, yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I wanted to uh, try and tell a narrative in the story of how things got to the stage. I, I spent some time in Germany speaking to Bruno Steinhoff, who started the company. Um, I spoke to most of the people, anyone who would, who would speak to me about this, Christo Visser, Whitey Besson, anyone who had a link to Steinhoff and who wanted to talk, I spoke to. I tried to speak to Marcus Joester quite a lot, sent him a lot of WhatsApp messages, and I would see the little blue text card, I know he'd read it, but he just avoided me. So, I mean, I spoke to a lot of people who worked with him over the years and built up a picture that way. Based, as you say, on dozens of interviews and these conversations that you had, was it difficult to get people to open up to you? I don't really think so. I mean, I think a lot of people had a very palpable wound from the Steinhoff case. They, they had lost a lot of money or their reputations had been severely damaged. So in a lot of cases, they were quite willing to talk about it. So I think people wanted to speak about it and, and, and delve into it. Um, and some of the former directors who feel quite scalded by what happened 
wanted to present their case and wanted to do it in, I suppose, a longer form narrative than perhaps, you know, a 400 word news article. So I think it's good to to dig into where things went wrong in a case like this and where they didn't go as wrong as has been suggested. It's the digging in which is also interesting because it's also based on a lot of documents that were hitherto unseen by people. Uh, again, without giving away sources and, 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 and the mechanics of it, uh, how were those procured and then how does the journalist in you then sift through all of that information to look for the nuggets? Well, I mean, in the last couple of weeks uh, at the Financial Mail, we've been working with Amber Mogani. They've got access to a lot of documents. We had access to documents over the past couple of months. You know, you speak to people, and there are a lot of people in the Steinhoff environment who have information and who feel that the story should come out. And there's a lot of publicly available documents. Mm -hmm. The story of Enron, for example, the biggest fraud in the U.S., was that essentially all the information was public. People just hadn't looked at it in the right way. They hadn't taken it through the right microcosm, I suppose, or telescope. And in this case, a lot of information was public. And so it just took looking at it, which a lot of people didn't do. As much as there is new documents and there are new things I did get, a lot of it is publicly available information that, that people just looked at through a different prism. Someone's just got to bother to go through all that information. Just a final question. How did you make sure that you were on safe legal ground here? Um, well, it was, it was, you know, looked at by a lawyer. Um, once or twice. Yeah, yes. once or twice. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing to do. Because you are making pretty serious allegations about what happened. Um, but, you know, in terms of making reasonable allegations based upon what seems to be the evidence, um, I think if you stick to that and you don't overreach, you should be on safe legal ground. I mean, the thing is that there's a Price Waterhouse Coopers investigation which is coming out at the end of this month. Mm. Um, and I spent quite a long time trying to speak to investigators and people working on that to get a sense of, of how contextually accurate things were. Um, it's always tricky, but that's. Book writing, I suppose. Final, final question. I presume Marcus Yost has read it. Uh, you don't know that. Maybe <laughs> you do. Um, what's the reaction been so far? From a lot of Steinhoff directors and people I've spoken to, it's been relatively positive. They, they feel that it's a fairly good work of research. Even if some of the Steinhoff directors um, I've spoken to say they didn't like this particular mm. thing or they didn't, you know, felt it make, made them look bad, mm. but generally the reaction has been positive, I suppose. But, you know, I don't know if Marcus Yost himself would, would agree with that. Um, yeah, He's very loath to answer questions. There's the, the understatement of the program today. The book is called Steinheist, Marcus Joester Steinhoff and South Africa's Biggest Corporate Fraud. The author is the editor of the Financial Mail, Rob Rose. And let me tell you, this book is highly, highly recommended. Next on the program, why this seemingly sweet ad was banned in Britain and why local experts says the largely invisible yet extremely valuable informal economy is being neglected. <laughs>